This is Jay Assassin. Is this on? May I, Wait, can I, say, can I say something first? Before I introduce you, no. Okay. <laughs> he is Bruce Goldstein, who knows more about movies than anybody, who runs the film forum in New York. This is the best theater in the world. The repertory section, over there. Hello, Bruce. <laughs> is this on? I, I also want to tell you my only other credential for doing this interview, and I'm a last-minute pinch hitter for Penelope Spheres, and I am not Penelope Spheres, you notice that. I've never even seen Wayne's World. I'm also the distributor of Rialto. We re-released re it in 1999 to great success, and that's how I became friends with Jules, and it's the greatest thing I ever released because of that. Thank you, Bruce. And I'm wondering whether this ovation is for Jules Dassin, the great French director, or for Carlo Vita, the great Italian actor, who plays César, César Le Millenay, that fantastic, incredible performance. And I'm constantly getting messages of, do you even know Jules Dassin? Jules Dassin. Everyone thinks you're a French director. What are you, really? I am Julie Dassin from Middletown, Connecticut. <laughs> he has a list. Well, we went over this. But, you know, prior to Rafifi, you made, and he was shocked to hear this, 11 features in Hollywood. I refuse. I refuse. Beginning in 1942, he'd also made a short he doesn't want to know anything about with, <laughs> for MGM. But he made seven films as a contract director for MGM, two for producer Mark Hellinger, mm -hmm. and two film Warren masterworks for Fox. Correct? <laughs> so how did you wind up making the quintessential French film noir? <laughs> Well, that's a long voyage, my friend. Uh, the years that uh, that you mentioned at MGM were a problem for me. I didn't know what I was doing. Except that I knew that every day, for a number of films, I would enjoy the privilege and the fun of working with Marsha Hunt. Hey, Marsha, if you're there, I love you. What was your question? <laughs> How did you wind up making a film in France? Well, there was a time when uh, I became unemployable in the United States. Um, and uh, you know, there's a long, long history of this. But anyhow, a uh, man was making a film producing a film called Rififi Chez Les Hommes. Uh, and uh, told me that uh, I was the only man who could make this film. Now, this was after five years of nada, no, no work at all. But I still could not say, why the only? He said, I tell you, we have a problem with Rififi. You see, the bad guys are all North Africans. And at this time, we are having, France is having such problem with um, Algeria and so on. Well, you, you can make the bad guys Americans. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And when I said to him, have you thought of making them French? <laughs> he hadn't. <laughs> I got, I got that job for the same reason I was blacklisted. <laughs> so. That's all you wish to say about the blacklist? <laughs> Enough. Okay. You know, we have other things to worry about these days. <laughs> I was thinking, for instance, about the Patriot Act. Right. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So let's talk about your painful early movie career a little bit. Very early ones. Your painful early career. But you started in the theater in the 30s, the Federal yes. Theater. Yes. Uh, Yiddish Theater. Yes. And uh, a man showed us an ad from the 30s from your Camp Kinderlon days, a Yiddish <laughs> camp. Do you it's know that who was being played by the great young director, Jules Dassin? So, this is a wonderful, oh boy, my most enjoyable, my most creative year was in Camp Kinderland. <laughs> where workers used to go for the holidays, and they thought they'd have holidays until I grabbed and made them act in the place. And, and it was a wonderful, wonderful place, a wonderful experience. We were all very left <laughs> dreamers. Until until we stopped dreaming. <laughs> but it was a wonderful place. It's had wonderful souvenirs and joyous, joyous times. How did that come into your script? I was building up to how you got into the movies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Jules> <laughs> um, I got into the movies, maybe by mistake, I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's, too, it's, too, it's too long to say. But you, were call, uh, you started in a program at RKO where you were brought in to observe. Oh, uh, that's right. I was brought to, uh, to be an uh, observer. That is, you observe, and you keep quiet, but they were giving me 250 bucks a week. That was, uh, I remember my agent saying, uh, maybe you can get you more. I said, whoever wants more? And I just, well, anyhow, so I observed Hitchcock. Now, observed is a, it's wrong. I was so terrified of this man, so dazzled by his technique, that I really used to hide in the corners to keep out of sight, and he would torture me. <laughs> After each take, he would say, is that all right for you tonight, Frenchie? <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a bad time. But uh, my contract was for six months to observe. I also observed Garth King make a film with uh, Carol Lombard and Lawson, who became a good friend. Uh, and then after six months were well, over, they said, you're fired. I said, oh. I've been uh, watching all the time, you've been paying me, and I say, well, go home, be fired. Well, somehow, I got a job with uh, MGM, and uh, this was after having watched Hitchcock, and uh, I said, goodbye, goodbye. 
didn't know I had been fired. And he said, all right, now you get ready to make a picture. But remember this, don't ever make pictures with children, animals, or Charles Lawson. <laughs> It so happened that some years later, I was making a film with love and animal and children. You can imagine the exchange of telegrams. For the record, it cannibal ghost with Charles Lawton and Margaret O'Brien, but I don't remember the animal. <laughs> and for the record, the Hitchcock film is Mr. and Mrs. Smith. That's right, yeah. So then you got a contract at MGM, and your first feature was Nazi Agent with Conrad Wright as good and evil identical twins. One a loyal American, the other a Nazi. <laughs> Who could ever forget it? Me, I'll forget it. Well, then how about Reunion in France? Oh, for that With John Wayne and John Crawford as French resistance fighters. Don't listen, don't listen to this. We don't know who's on there. So you made seven films. I never heard of them. What about Marsha's two films, Letter to Evie and The Affairs of... My name is Marsha. I hope she may have. I love her. Next. What? <laughs> what made you leave MGM? By the way, Faye Canning told us tonight, this very evening, that you were Mayer's favorite, Louis Mayer's favorite young director. He loved you. I wish he hadn't. Uh, I, I, I don't know where Faye got that story, because uh, after a while, we were not very polite with each other. Uh, and my whole struggle was to get away from that contract. It was those days when they had those slave contracts. When you were in the contract for seven years, they could uh, option, uh, continue every six months. You could not. So you were hooked for seven years. Uh, that's a long term. No more to say about that. No, no more Ruby Mayer stories? Is it true that you once said Ruby Mayer's arm around your shoulder meant his hand was closer to your throat? <laughs> I'm not sure I need that. <laughs> okay, so you leave MGM and you work for Mark Callender, independent producer working for Universal, making pictures for Universal International. Uh, made yeah. two extraordinary films, Brute Force, prison movie. Which you just screened here yesterday, I think. And a seminal film in the history of movies, The Naked City, the first major sound film made largely on the streets of New York. Yeah. That, was, that was a very interesting, interesting experience. Uh, the producer was Mark Hellinger, a very strange, Interesting man who died very young only because he had read in the newspaper that there were really only two great brandy drinkers, one being Winston Churchill and the other Mark Ellinger. But he didn't like second place and killed himself very young and nice man. A uh, producer who, was, who took care of the director, the studio was criticizing. They didn't want the film to be shot away from studio. And they said, this kid is making us a travelogue. But he was wonderful and steadfast, but kept on with the cognac. And he died before the picture uh, opened. I am sure of that. Because uh, at that time, the blacklist was in the air, and particularly with the screenplay, a screenplay was written 
by Albert Maltz, based on a story by Alvin Wall. And so, uh, when the film was finished, Albert Maltz and the whole black thing was in the atmosphere. But I was going off to New York to do a play, and I said goodbye to Mark. And I said, now that's the final cut. That's the final cut. Because there are all these whispers around. Because in the film, there's much that was taken out. Because uh, I saw the, the, the contrast in the big city. So different lives in the big cities. I need more water, sorry. And many cuts were made, many cuts were made. And I am sure to this day that they were not made with Mark's knowledge. I think they got their hands on it after Mark died. And I saw the New York opening and just walked out of the theater weeping because of things I cared about so much in the film were taken away. But that's a long time ago and I'm okay now. It's still a great film and it's screening here and I think Malvin Wall will be, who's here tonight. Yes, yes. He'll be introducing it on. Oh, really? One of the shows in this series, yeah. You were one of the first to do extensive location work in New York. I sound here. Actually, that's not true. The first man who did a lot of it was uh, the house on 92nd Street by whose help? Henry Hathaway. Henry Hathaway. Uh, I think we did more away from the studio and most of the interiors also in New York. Uh, he didn't get up to the top of the Williamsburg Bridge, though. <laughs> no. No. This was before the days of, you know, nowadays, in my neighborhood in New York, every other week is a uh, filming day. You know, there's 20 vans. You didn't have these luxuries they have today. Yeah. Location. How did you film on location in New York in those days? Oh, boy. We knew all kinds of tricks because people would gather by the hundreds interested in watching shooting and we had all kinds of tricks to hide the camera i had a portable newsstand um, i had uh, oh, fl uh, garden of flowers of florist i forget any language anymore uh, a florist uh, delivery uh, thing with mirrors on it, but see-through mirrors, so I could use that. But my favorite, because they used to know where you were going to shoot, they found out from the hotels for the actors, and sometimes you'd come to the location, and there were truly hundreds of people. How do you shoot? So I had one guy with me for most, for most of the film. He was great. About, I would put him up on the ladder about 200 yards away with an American flag, and he would be ranting against the society of our time, and the people would rush to him, and I'd get my shot. <laughs> Yeah. So after Hellinger died, your uh, Naked City made you kind of a, a, a sensation in the industry, did, did it not? And you were signed by Zanuck for a couple of pictures at Fox, and, where you made yes. two more location movies, Thieves High, Highway, shot in San Francisco. True. And then N Night in the City. Night in the City. Uh, how much time do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> because I made this public declaration. <laughs> I said, I'm old enough to say what I feel. 
I liked Daryl Zanuck. <laughs> and I did. And I used to say to him, Daryl, look, your ambition is to be a nice guy, but you can't make it. <laughs> But he is the man, uh, when things got really ugly in California, in uh, Hollywood, and uh, after a spirited meeting with the, the heads of uh, Fox, including uh, the uh, brother Skouras, in one little interesting passion, he said he was going to step on my neck because I was a uh, uh, dirty red. And, uh, well, there's a long story of preceding that and why all of that, but anyhow, that night, and he, the, uh, the end was get the hell out of here, so forth. And uh, a historic thing happened. Daryl Zana came to my house. Well, my house was not in Beverly Hills, it was Bronson Avenue, and that was not very chic. But he came, and he said, uh, you're leaving for London tomorrow. I said, I can't. I have problems, um, family problems. He said, listen, you have family problems, you will have family needs. Now, you're going to London to make this picture because, kiddo, it might be the last film you ever make. So, I went there, and I want to tell you one more thing about Zanuck. He did say, Get that script going out as fast as you can and start shooting with the most expensive scenes so they won't stop you. There. And uh, a little before, uh, about two weeks, two and a half weeks before the shooting was supposed to, to us to begin, he called me on t by telephone and said, uh, do you owe me one? I said, yes, I do. He said, all right, I want you to write in the part for Gene Tierney. I said, what part? Uh, and that was a few weeks before shooting. Gene Tierney is a big star. I said, you'll do that for me, won't you? And I did. And this man, He's known to be so tough and cruel and restless. He did this. He told me later. He told me then that Jean had just had a big chagrin d'amour. She had a bad time with a love story. Did love affair that didn't work out because she was suicidal. <laughs> and he said the only thing that helped this girl is to put her to work. Now that was the cruel, terrible Daryl Zanuck. The name of the movie? The movie was Night in the City. So. So, you never returned to Fox? Did you ever go back to the lot? No. I was not allowed back on the lot. Um, I don't blame the sons on it, but such was the atmosphere. And uh, to correspond with an editor by telephone is not the best way to edit film. And nor. Uh, with the man who wrote the music, Franz Waxman. And this was all done by telephone. But that then was uh, the end of my uh, 
Hollywood career. And it took, and it took um, five years to get another job, which was Rififi. But you did go back to the lot. I did go back to the lot in 1968. I made one picture in the States. Just that one more. At Fox? It was at Fox. 68. No, it was at Paramount. Oh, no, that was uptight at Paramount. Yes, uptight. I'm talking about when you went back to the Fox lot yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I was welcomed with open arms. <laughs> and we've got to tell you why we were at the Fox Lot. Yes, I will tell you why. Uh, it was wonderful. First of all, they took me to the restaurant with all kinds of folklore of movies. And they gave me a salad. Yeah, how did they eat it? How do you guys eat so much food? They piled it on. Well, yeah, that was nice. And actually, I met him. I met with this man who, there are heroes in the industry who are not the stars or the directors, the men who preserve films and restore films. And the women. And the women. And this young, very handsome man was just restoring, putting him back in the And I saw bits of it, and I, I just say salut uh, for a night in the city, which we'll be showing you. Know? We show, I just want to say something about night in the city. We saw a print in Athens, which I showed at Film Form for a week, which was gorgeous. What we saw yesterday was 10 times more gorgeous. It's the most beautiful black and white print I've ever seen. Sure, man. And it's going to be shown in this series. And if you miss it, you should kill yourselves. <laughs> it was, they found the original nitrate camera negative. And it's a restoration of 20th Century Fox in the Academy. And the, the young man was Sean Belston. And there are lots of other people working on this project. Brilliant, unsung people. Yes, sir. And there's a lot of others, by the way. I think, work on your... I think we should let the people go home. No? Oh, well, it's up to, the, up to you. Yeah. We haven't even mentioned Melina. <laughs> because Lefifi was a, a turning point in your life in many ways, and it indirectly led to your meeting your future wife. Did it not? What let's go? Rafifi. By your winning the award. Oh. Uh, Rafifi was chosen to represent uh, France in uh, the Cannes Film Festival. And at that same year, uh, a film, Melina's first film called Stella, was being shown. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Um, a Greek film, very modest budget, but everybody was toting her to win the prize. That was, that was the talk of the festival. And she believed it, and other people did too. <laughs> Am I getting away from the mic here? Anyhow, uh, it turned out <coughs> that uh, I won the prize to a festival for best direction, and Melina did not get the prize. And uh, leaving there, I saw her sitting in the corner and kind of weepy. And I came to her and said, I introduced myself and said, uh, you know, the prize is the prize, but you're worth so much more. And she said in her most spirited Greek accent, yeah, you got the prize. Screw off. <laughs> and so does love at first sight. 
And you wound up making eight pictures with her? <laughs> and we won the jury. And two phenomena. Two phenomena. But never on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Another great ice picture, Top Happy. <laughs> Oh, and never on Sunday was an enormous worldwide hit, and nobody wanted to back it in originally. Nobody. Nobody. Because the budget I was asked for was shocked them a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and I couldn't get it. It was very, very tough. And finally, uh they loaned me sixty thousand dollars with the condition that when I finished it, because I had no script, I told them I want to make this picture. Was as you can read the script. I said I didn't write it yet. I want to write it in Athens, and they said, oh, "Well, we can't do business that way." And so I was standing. So they loaned me uh, sixty thousand dollars which if I had to pay back at the time, I'd go to jail. Uh, and then they saw the uh, script and they said, okay. And, uh, but then I had the problem of the actor. And I didn't have more than $20,000 in the budget for an actor. And no. So, I played it. <laughs> oh, you, you, you did I play it. <laughs> and I must I tell you this, I love this story. But it became a, a great success immediately. And uh, just by chance, it was running in Paris in Champs-Élysées. And uh, I run into Jack Lemon, and I said, "You here? How long are you here for? A while?" And I ran to the uh, the Paris representative of the United Artists, but a member of the Sorry, I said, "Look, please, will you give me money to remake the film with Jack?" And they said, "Yeah." Because it was already a real promising hit, the end of the first releases, and Jack Lennon. And uh, so I said, Jack, look, I can do this, put it all together. There won't be more than three works, a three weeks' work. Come and go, and I give you a lot of money, Jack. I said, Well, let's see. And we went to the theater together. And he watched it. And to the end of it, he said, Listen, Judy, you're so terrible and so that's charming. Let it alone. <laughs> and that is a true story, word for word. <laughs> And as a result, also, tourism in Athens skyrocketed. Yes, yes, it did. Enormous. A uh, film uh, for tourism is such an extraordinary thing, especially if it's uh, an out of the way place that not many people and uh, not the films have been made. I made Top Copy in Turkey. And the next year, boom, tourism. It works with films. Anyhow, I don't I think we should say goodnight. <laughs> yes. Actually, well, one, uh, we have to talk about what you're doing now. I mean, we're in a museum after all. Um, it's actually what he's going to discuss is actually verboten in a museum among curators. But uh, you and Melina were together for 40 years. And I'm, I'm glad you asked me to talk about that. Um, when Melina died, I made a foundation called the Melina Mercury Foundation to continue work that she had begun 
Manin was the longest reigning uh, minister of culture in the history of Greece. And she really did wonderful, wonderful work all over Greece, in the small town, everywhere, fine, fine work, including creating a, a 10 regional theaters where there never was any, a theater anywhere. That was only one of them. But um, I'll tell you a story this way. <laughs> I made a film with Melina Fedra. And uh, I wanted to film a scene where there is a, a, an, encounter, an encounter at the British Museum with the Parthenon novels, part of it, in the background. And particularly, it was one of those fantastic sculptures of, of the horse. And since the original Fedra, uh, Hippolyte, the young man, is killed by charging horses, I wanted that reference in the film. And it was very hard to get permission to shoot in the British Museum. And they kept putting us off, putting us off, until finally uh, I came with Melita for the first time. She was with me, and the guy said, "Well, you know," and Melina, in her great accented English, said, "They are ours. They are our satchels." <laughs> And um, when Manin became appointed minister, much later, of course, uh, I happened to be there. A British uh, news uh, reporter asked her what would be her first act as minister. She said, I would ask for the return of the Elgin Marbles. <laughs> That was the last time she used the word Elgin, because she said there are no such thing as Elgin marbles. <laughs> These were made by a man whose name was Phidias. They are marbles of the Parthenon. So now even today, the British refer to it as the Parthenon marbles. And this became our campaign. Many, many years, a lot of tufts of tufts, because a, a British trustee has a job to keep what he has. But we have been campaigning for many years, and now all uh, a sondage of, uh, for, we got a polls, poll, poll, polls. Yeah. Uh, the great majority of the British people say, give them back, give them back. One of the last polls reaching to 80%, give them back. And a great majority of the uh, Labour Party uh, uh, deputies, deputies, yeah, say give back. And there was, we hope to have a new museum ready to receive them, because what the museum that we have now is not ample enough. It's old, it's built on the Acropolis, which is wonderful, or near, but there's not enough room, not enough space, not enough the air condition and so on. And we're building this new museum, and it's a beauty, it's a beauty. But there are all kinds of delays and problems. You had to expropriate different houses around, so it took a long time. But it will be, and everyone knows, they will call it Melina's Museum.
I thank you for being here. I feel friendship. Uh, I want to thank the museum for creating this affair with the help of the Greek press office. They were wonderful. And that the uh, Screen Directors Guild, the Screen Writers Guild, and the Academy are sponsoring this event. I am very grateful. Thank you.